Thanks, Annie. Okay, first up, here we go. Uh, so here's a disclaimer statement. Uh, we're a UK quoted public company, so I need to show you one of these. Okay, so um, Reneuron is a pure cell therapy business, uh, for those of you that uh, don't know the story. Um, and the business is based around two stem cell assets. Um, one is called CTX, which is a neural progenitor cell line that's targeting neurovascular indications, the lead program there being stroke disability. Um, we also use our CTX cell line to harvest exosomes, and we have an emerging um, cancer program with exosomes as therapeutic agents. I'm not gonna say any more about that program today in the interest of time. It is also pretty early stage. Um, but there are a number of uh, cell therapy players that are starting to use the, uh, the potential of their own uh, exosomes, um, both as a vector for gene delivery and so on, and also as a therapeutic agent. Uh, the second asset is uh, a retinal progenitor cell line, which we call HRPC, human retinal progenitor cells, and that's targeting uh, back of the eye retinal degeneration. Our first target there is retinitis pigmentosa. And I'll come back to both of the two core programs uh, shortly. Uh, so here's our pipeline, and as you can see, uh, CTX targeting stroke disability is our most advanced program. That's currently about to start a phase 2B study here in the US. Um, we also have a, uh, we have targeted CLI in the past, critical limb ischemia. We're not investing in that program at the current time. We have some phase one data, but uh, we're deploying resources elsewhere for now. Um, and as I mentioned, our exosome program is targeting uh, a solid tumor indication, which we hope to get into clinical development towards the back end of next year. Um, and the lead target for our HRPC cells is retinitis pigmentosa and we'd like to start a phase two study in cone rod dystrophy, a related indication, uh, sometime next year as well. I'll come back to that. So just uh, in terms of CTX, the CTX cell line itself, or the product, what is it? So it is an allergenic, cryopreserved human neur neural stem cell uh, line. Uh, we manufacture it uh, with contract manufacturers under GMP conditions. It currently has a 12-month shelf life in its cryopreserved form. So what we're trying to do with CTX is, is get it into as close a form as possible as a, as a conventional uh, uh, biotherapeutic in terms of how it's made, shipped, stored, and then used at clinical site. And it's taken us quite a few years really to get the cryopreservation technology optimized such that we have a cell product that we are able to ship and store uh, uh, with relative ease, uh, and it can be thawed and used as required uh, at the hospital. So just moving on to the lead indication, we're targeting stroke, and as I'm sure you all know, stroke is a major unmet medical need, both in the acute and in the post-stroke uh, phase, in terms of stroke disability, which is where we're focused. Um, uh, it has a very, very high incidence and is a huge drag on health and social care costs uh, in the developed world. Um, there's no real treatments available bar one in the acute phase, which is out of place, of course, and there really is nothing available therapeutically other than uh, rehabilitation measures in the chronic phase. So we're targeting patients that have suffered a stroke, an ischemic stroke, survived it, and have a residual motor deficit as a result, uh, which severely impacts their quality of life. So in terms of cell therapy approaches for stroke, which have been around uh, for a while, as I'm sure you know, um, really we're looking at two paradigms here. In the acute phase, in the hours and days after stroke, you're really looking at cells to exert a neuroprotective effect. In the longer term chronic phase, in the weeks, months, and even years after stroke, you're really looking for a cell therapy approach to effect repair through regeneration. And cells, putatively at least, can do that through a number of mechanisms, neurogenesis, angiogenesis, and so on. And indeed, um, having worked with CTX as a cell line for well over a decade now, we do understand a fair bit about how we believe our cells are exerting their effects in the chronic stroke situation. And in common with other cell types, as I'm sure you'll hear today or you already know, uh, cells, uh, stem cells do exert their effects in a number of different ways. They have multimodal mechanisms of action. And um, uh, we've listed a few here. So again, neurogenesis, angiogenesis are relevant to what we're doing with CTX in the post-stroke phase, as well as a degree of immune modulation as well, which is perhaps more important in the acute phase. Okay, so how far have we got with our stroke program? Well, we've run two studies, which we call PICES, that's Pilot Investigation of Stem Cells in Stroke, that's the acronym, 
Uh, Pisces 1 and Pisces 2, uh, these were both UK-based studies, we're a UK business, so it was easier to go uh, to our home regulator on home turf for these early studies. Uh, and these were run actually quite some time ago, so again, we were somewhat leading the field, certainly from a, a regulatory standpoint in setting the pathway for this type of approach. Um, so it made sense to us to do the, the first studies as, as close as we could to our to our home, uh, our home regulator. Uh, so we had very, very close relationships and built the regulatory pathway in, in conjunction with the MHRA and the, uh, uh, the ethics bodies that existed at that time in the UK. Um, FISIS-1 was an 11 patient safety study, a dose escalation study, uh, which um, met its end point in terms of showing the safety of the, of the approach. These cells, by the way, are transplanted directly into the brain through stereotaxic injection. So a relatively small payload of cells, 20 million being the highest dose in Pisces 1, um, uh, directly implanted close to uh, the lesion in ischemic stroke patients. Uh, which, and ischemic stroke patients um, account for around 80% or thereabouts of all stroke suffer uh, sufferers, uh, the other 20 being hemorrhagic strokes. Um, so we follow Pisces 1 with Pisces 2, which again was a single arm study looking this time at efficacy measures um, against a baseline level of disability in these patients. And the patients in Pisces 2 were monitored for quite a period of time to ensure a stable baseline level of disability before they got the cells, and they were monitored between two and 12 months post-treatment. Um, and again, we were pleased to see uh, no cell-related adverse events and, and, and some really very interesting and intriguing signs of efficacy against the measures we were using in this study. Um, most especially against modified Rankin, which is going to be our primary endpoint in the phase 2b study we're about to start. Um, and modified Rankin is a measure of functional disability, a measure of dependence in these patients. It's a six-point scale, and any one-point drop on that measure is really indicative of, of clinical significance and significance for the patients in terms of quality of life. And the key learning on this particular measure um, from Pisces 2 was that if we excluded patients that had no residual upper arm movement before they were treated, then the actual response rate we saw against this measure improved quite dramatically, as you can see in the, in the numbers here. So these are measuring the numbers of patients that did drop at least one measure on MRS uh, in this study. So, um, and perhaps intuitively that makes sense, if you do have some residual upper arm disability, it suggests a... Uh, 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 an intact cortical spinal tract and therefore might, you know, might, might actually lead or, or lead to a higher chance of efficacy with a cell-mediated approach. So we will be targeting um, patients with NIHSS of, of less than four at baseline in the, in the phase 2b study. And the reason we're using modified ranking, again, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an endpoint in these types of studies that FDA is very comfortable with. It is a US study, so we needed to make sure that they were happy with the primary endpoint. Um, and as you can see here, th this, this is actually taken from a registry study in Sweden uh, a couple of years ago that's been published in over 40,000 disabled uh, stroke patients in Sweden. And it shows you the pharmacoeconomic benefit of dropping patients a notch on modified Rankin, uh, most especially from four to three or from three to two. And again, the lower the score on Rankin, the less dependent the patient is. Uh, so again, in our phase 2b study, we're going to be targeting patients uh, at MRS 4 or 3 to see if we can, we can get them uh, to, drop, which, to, to drop one measure, or at least one measure, from that baseline, because that's where we see the greatest pharmacoeconomic benefit for the patients uh, and for the healthcare system generally uh, in due course if we can show uh, efficacy. So the phase 2b study, which we're calling, unsurprisingly, Pisces 3 after the first two studies, uh, has, uh, has been approved by, by FDA. We got that earlier this year. It's a 110 patient uh, study with one-to-one -one randomization against sham surgery. That's the closest we can get to a true placebo control with a direct implantation of stem cells into the brain, which is what we're doing in this study. Um, primary endpoint is modified Rankin at six months post-treatment. And we've chosen six months because, again, what we learned in the first two studies was that if we were gonna see uh, uh, a measure of improvement in this patient, it was in patients, it was usually manifest um, by around six months. In other words, if you hadn't seen efficacy um, uh, by six months, you weren't going to see it. And also it wasn't, it was very unlikely to improve further after that six month point. So six months is, is the endpoint that we're using post-treatment. Um, there are secondary endpoints as well. Um, so, so much for, uh, for the CTX cell line in stroke. Just a quick word on the human retinal progenitor cells. 
Um, and again, this is using retinal progenitors really to, uh, to address retinal degeneration at the back of the eye uh, and, and using the potential of these cells, photoreceptor progenitors, to preserve vision uh, and also, uh, all being well, to improve vision through a mix of either differentiation and engraftment into host tissue, host retinal tissue, and trophic support of host cells as well. Um, this is a program we've been working with in collaboration with Mike Young's lab at Scapens at Harvard for a number of years. That's where we licensed the original technology, uh, which we've built on over the years. And the current phase one, two study in, in retinitis pigmentosa is currently being, currently being run at Mass Eye and Air over in Boston as well. And of course, we, we, we've worked collaboratively with uh, 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 Moorfields over in the UK. Uh, again, this is a cryopreserved product, so we can ship and store and use uh, 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 on demand. And we're targeting RP, uh, which is a primary loss of rod photoreceptors, genetically mediated. And as I mentioned earlier, we'd like to, alongside that, target CRD as well, which is a very equivalent uh, retinal degenerative disease where loss of cone photoreceptors is the, uh, is the, uh, is the primary issue there. Um, using a cell therapy approach should be gene independent. Obviously, both of these conditions are associated with a, a large number of gene deficiencies. Uh, we're looking to target the underlying causes of that in terms of loss of photoreceptors using cell replacement or trophic effects, as I mentioned. So RP uh, is the first target. Um, again, it's an orphan status disease. You, essentially, you can get it very early, actually, in childhood, and it progresses over a number of years. You lose peripheral vision, as you see in the image here, ultimately leading to blindness. Um, our own program has orphan drug designation in Europe and the US and, and FDA fast track designation as well. And as I mentioned, we're currently in the middle of a phase one, two study at uh, Mass Eye and Ear. Phase one elements completed, phase two A is currently in progress, looking for top line readouts in the middle of next year. And I'm just gonna finish up uh, in the time remaining, uh, just a couple of things to, or a few things to watch out for then over the next year to 18 months in those programs I've described. Probably the most important milestone for us is gonna be the phase 2B data in stroke, of course, in early 2020. Um, and uh, in the middle of next year, expecting the phase 1, 2A uh, top line data, as mentioned, uh, uh, and all being well, uh, a phase 2B study to follow. And alongside that, a phase 2 study in CRD as well. Uh, and finally, as I mentioned at the start, uh, uh, perhaps more speculatively, a first clinical study using our exosomes in a, in a solid tumor indication. And uh, with that, I'll finish. Thank you. We have two minutes left. Yeah. Any question from the audience? To Michael? Didn't think you'd have time for questions, but yeah, sorry. go ahead. One of the strangest things I've ever seen. What a weird device. Um, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> my question is always when I consider um, allogeneic stem cell therapies is what happens when you expand the cells from a single cell? What kind of genomic... Uh, Variants. Uh, yeah, I, did, I actually time. didn't. I didn't mention CTX is an immortalized cell line, so it's so it's engineered genetically. And and as I said, we we originally derived it back in 2003, 2004, and expanded it at really quite high passage out to about 44, 45. Clearly, karyotypic um, stability is a, is a is a, a major issue. Right. It's actually where we came unstuck in a, in a previous existence at Renewal, and it wasn't the first cell line we tried this with but the CTX line does show karyotypic stability. Uh, it's a single insertion site as well on the genome in terms of how we expand it. And it yeah. seems to be a very robust uh, and very specific um, uh, uh, immortalization technology. So, so it's something that, you know, I mean, clearly there are release criteria that, that mean that the, the, you know, the amount of testing one has to do to release cell banks because they're immortalized by, by genetic variation is, is pretty onerous and yes. just, empirical data shows that it seems to be stable and robust over time. That's good. You're aware of the, the problems people have had with embryonic stem cells getting p53 mutations after you've yeah. cultured them for a long time. Absolutely, yeah. But we don't see that, at least we've not you seen looked it, for it then. In, in CTX. Thank you. Um, any further questions? Yeah, please. Okay. Thanks again. Thank you.